Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Welcome to everybody. It's so lovely to see you all here, so many of you. It's really heartwarming. For the children here, younger and older, there's a colouring in sheet and or a find a word over in the corner. You can either do it in the children's corner or you can bring it back to your seat, whatever takes your fancy, but feel free to use, utilise those. Christ is risen. Hallelujah. He's risen, risen indeed. indeed. Alleluia. We'll go again. Christ is risen. Alleluia. He, he is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Alleluia. Alleluia.
be with you. And also with you. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John, chapter 20, beginning at the first verse. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went towards the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outrun Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white, sitting there with the body of Jesus, where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned round and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? For whom are you looking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. For the Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we remember the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, may the words of my mouth and indeed the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. I wonder, have you ever wanted to be an armchair detective, a sleuth? No, probably not. Fa solving famous cases, historical cases, cold cases, current cases. Well, if you were, and you thought you were a Sherlock, imagine you were called to the scene of a murder or a suspicious death. 
Observation is very important as a detective. In fact, in my days, in my previous life when I was one, um, they used to have things called observation tests in detective training. I don't observe too many things well these days, but that's what it was then. When you go to a scene, for instance, you may observe certain things. In your mind, you're looking for evidence to support and build a case. The first you may observe as you go into a scene of a suspicious death is a body. There, lying on the floor in the library like Pluto, the person has been pronounced dead by a medical professional. So there it is, the first piece of evidence. You have the fact of death. Then you observe further and look for something possibly either that happened or was admitted to happen that caused the death. And you look around and you see the victim's skull with a big mark in it. And you see an axe on the floor beside the body. So your preliminary conclusions is that it was probably done with malicious intent. Then you ask the scientific people on the scene to give you an estimate of the time of death. And they will tell you about rigor mortis and they will talk about the temperature of the body and a lot of other things and give you an estimated time. And therefore you have a timeline so you can have some idea of what went on. Of course that will be established properly when they have a post-mortem. So you was, you, you've come to the conclusion that the person has died preliminary a bit of the injuries that were sustained at that time with a particular weapon. And you gather the physical evidence up, um, you gather the weapon, the scientific people go over the whole scene and work out all the different bits and pieces of scientific evidence. And then you, of course, at the same time are interviewing people of interest. Uh, witnesses, suspects, those types of people. And when, all you, when you gather all the evidence and you compile it and analyse it and after the coroner's report and uh, you may end up charging someone for the, event, for the offence. And then the detectives, the lawyers and the court system bring the matter to a conclusion. That's normally what happens. Now, in lots of ways, when I became a Christian many, 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 many years ago, I sort of investigated the resurrection of Jesus and had a look at that. But it's a bit like investigating a murder in reverse, in lots of ways. And of course, many historians and journalists have researched and looked at the case against Christ or the case for Christ. I was reading a book many years later, this book here, by Lee, Lee Strobel, Strobel. Lee Strobel um, was an investigative, investigative journalist uh, trained at Yale Law School, Master of Law. Uh, he was a convinced atheist. He was also an award-winning legal editor of the Chicago Tribune. Uh, a convinced atheist, as I said. And he set out to actually prove that the biblical material was wrong. He wanted to really turn it up as a hoax or a fanciful story or something that just doesn't really happen. There's something we just celebrate that it's not there. He approached his investigation of the Christian message uh, and he looked at the historicity of Jesus, the evidence of the resurrection. He relentlessly and doggedly, in a doggedly fashion, was determined to discredit all the information. Before he had finished the investigation, he became a committed Christian. He said, to be honest, I didn't want to believe that Christianity could radically transform someone's character and values. It was much easier to raise doubts, manufacture outrageous objections that, than to consider the possibility that God could actually, could actually trigger a revolution and a turnaround in my life. That great author, C.S. Lewis, uh, apologist, professor of classics and history at Oxford University, was a convinced atheist. And when he did the same thing and considered the Christian faith, he made this statement. He said, I was the most reluctant convert in all of England. And so let's have a look. I just want to, this morning, just have a brief look at some of the things that those people raised and the evidence that came up. 
as we think about the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. The first thing that some people would like to consider is the impact that Christ made on the world. In only three short years, he was in public ministry. The impact he had on the world was unparalleled and has been unparalleled to any other person in world history. But that is strange, isn't it? Very strange. There are so many things that mitigated against that, that changed, that made the world change from BC to AD at that point in time in history. There are so many things. I mean, Jesus, at the time, Jesus spent most of his time in remote places. Jesus never wrote anything about himself. Yet there's been more written about him than any other person in history. His disciples were dejected and a dispirited lot. So how many things mitigate against this? He was rejected by the very people he came to minister to and to preach to. And he was executed for it in that bloody violent fashion on Good Friday. And Peter wrote this, the very stone that the builders have rejected has become the head of the corner. In spite of all of that, the impact that Christ has made on world history is greater than any other person. How can that be? The second thing is the eyewitness account. We're told that uh, several people claim to have seen the risen Lord. We had a reading today from 1 Corinthians where it said he appeared to Peter, then the 12, then he appeared to more than 500 people at one time, most of whom are still alive, but some have fallen asleep. Now let's think about that. Just think about that for a minute. If one of your children, in the past or present, came home from school and said a really outrageous thing, like she came home and she said, I've just won the World Championship shot put record. Now, yet you have, she's had no history of shot puts. I guess you would be inclined to probably doubt what she was saying, not believe it, or be sceptical about it. Eh? But if several of her friends came home and told you exactly the same thing, you may start to think, well, What's gone on? You might even smell their breath to see if there's been anything they've been taking to uh, hallucinate about this whole thing. But what happens if the whole senior school of 500 of them tell you the same thing and then the principal writes it in a communique recording it? Even though you have not seen the event, you'd have to believe it. And this is what Paul is saying. That's what St Paul is saying, that more than 500 people have seen the risen Lord to those people that he was writing to and talking to about it. Not just one or two, but a great bunch of people. Yet there were still doubters, were there not? The story of Thomas is one of them, of his disciples wanting, he wanted physical evidence. Unless I see the nail prints in his hands and see the spear hole in his side, I will not believe. Jesus appears to him in 20, John 20. And he comes to him in the resurrection. And he says, come over here, Thomas. And Thomas, come over. And he said, here, see my hands? And he shows them his hands. Put your finger in the hole in my hand and put your hand in my side and do not be faithless, but believing. And Thomas responded to him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said this, Blessed are you, Thomas, because you believed and you've seen, but more blessed are those who have not seen yet believe. Above all, the most authentic thing to me about this is the fact that the first witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus Christ were two women. That really is remarkable in this context and in the context of first century Christianity. Because sadly in those days, and we have the same debate today of course, but sadly in those days, women were not considered to be credible witnesses. 
Yet, deliberately, the writer has recorded that the first two witnesses were women. Is that not strange? If he was trying to make it up? It's the last thing he would want to say. So think about it if you're a sleuth. It doesn't make sense. And that was deliberate. He, they were recording what happened. Now, reading various other Christian, non-Christian authors of the day and historians, Josephus, Tacitus, all those people, none of them have really argued against it. None of them in that day. The guards at the tomb is another piece of evidence, isn't it? Is it not? They tried to make up a story that the body was stolen by the disciples. They said we were, they were, someone, the official said they must have been all asleep and they came, rolled the stone back and took the body. Now, that's really remarkable in itself when you think about it. A Roman guard was not two guys, one guy or something like that, it was 11. And they were highly trained soldiers. No way would every one of them been asleep unless they were taking something. No way. They would be working on shifts all the way through the night. Because they knew the rumour that Jesus was going to rise from the dead, and that's why they put a Roman guard on the tomb. They knew that. Well, the officials knew what was being said. That's why they put the guard on the tomb. But you see, none of them, and then they scurried around and they tried to scramble and do damage control to say, oh, the body was stolen or something else. When you look at it, no one ever said, he was in the tomb. No one ever said that. Even from the first writings, they were trying to make excuses of why the tomb was empty. It's interesting. Now another point of circumstance, and I won't go on forever about this, you can read it for yourself, but another point is the transformation of all the followers, the disciples. Think about that. Peter denies Jesus three times when he's arrested. He is terrified, frightened that he's going to suffer the same consequence. He's terrified. All the disciples take off for the hills. They don't want anything to do with it because they thought they were going to suffer the same consequences in that brutal, bloody, violent program that the officials put forward for Jesus. They thought they were going to cop it as well. Yet after the resurrection, we have that reading from Acts. Or reading from Acts, Acts chapter 2. Peter stands with the eleven, lifts up his voice and addresses the very same people that arrested him and had the power to arrest them. And he addresses them and he says to them, Peter said to them, let this be known to you and hear what I am saying. This Jesus whom you crucified and killed by the hands of law in a lawless fashion, God raised him up having released him from death. And know assuredly that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus, whom you crucified. Pretty, pretty powerful stuff. What changed all those disciples, more or less overnight, from being terrified, frightened, rebellious, running away from everything, denial people, all together in the same place, and ultimately all of them laid down their life for their faith? And as I said, the last piece of evidence really is the empty tomb. For today, that is. No one has ever found the body of Jesus, even to this day. The tomb is still empty. If you contrast it with um, other religions of the world, and I don't want to decry other religions or anything else, but the leaders of other religions, Confucius died in 479 BC. He was age 79. They know that he's still in the ground. Buddha died at 483 BC. He was aged 80. And he's still in the ground. They know where his grave is. Muhammad died in 632 AD at 62. He died and he's still in his grave. But the uniqueness of the Christian faith is that Jesus claimed to be the Son of God and his tomb was empty. His tomb was empty. That is the difference. That is the stark difference. The last thing I want to say today is the is the power of the risen Christ today. You are here as a testimony to that. We have gathered here this morning, we've made an effort to come to church this morning 
because we want to celebrate and we want to focus and commemorate that the resurrection of Jesus Christ in our own lives. 2.5 billion people around the world today will be celebrating the fact that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. Biggest organisation in the world, you may say. But in the end, can I say, it is not a matter, it's not a matter of evidence. I can stand here all day and give you as much evidence as you want. We can do a lecture series on it and perhaps we'll come to a point where we can convince you about the facts of the resurrection and the facts of biblical history and all those other facts. We can do that, that's easy. And we can go into that and you can say, okay, you've convinced me, but I still don't believe it. I still don't believe it. You see, it's a matter of faith. It's a matter of commitment. It's not a matter of evidence. All the evidence does is help you realise that your faith is not a leap into the dark. It's, in a, it's a leap into the light of truth. I mean, if you take the extreme example, even the devil knows that Jesus is the son of God. But he doesn't believe him. He doesn't follow him. It's a matter of faith and commitment. And so, friends, as we gather here today, we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He is the Son of God, the Lord of Lords. Thomas said, my Lord and my God. And he has the ability to transform your life and my life. And may God bless and keep us as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead.
shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant make you perfect in every good work to do his will and working in you that which is pleasing in his sight and the blessing of God Almighty the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you and those who you love now and always. Amen.
Well, friends, Christ has risen. Happy Easter. Thank you for joining us today in our very special service that we've had where we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Have a lovely day and enjoy your family. Thank you for coming.